I don't think that that kind of sadistic streak that you see reflected in Dan's thoughts and in Jack's thoughts is alien to the people who read these books and watch these movies. I think it's a big part of why people like them so much is because it is an acknowledgement of some of the uglier parts of human nature without looking away from it, acknowledging that, you know, you're not alone in sometimes having those kinds of really fucked up impulses and thoughts and feelings and that that's not all you are. Hello and welcome to Unramblings, our podcast about stories and storytelling. I'm Faye Fix. And I'm Charlin. And this is our one year anniversary episode. We've been doing this for a full year. Yay! So... When we did our first episode a year ago, it was released on November 7th, 2019. We did The Shining by Stephen King, and then we talked about Stanley Kubrick's adaptation in, you know, a reasonable and polite way. Sure. Um, Let's go with that. I made a joke at the time that maybe if we kept doing this for a year, because at the time we weren't really sure how long we were going to do it for, that maybe we would do the sequel. Um, They were just bringing out the movie at the time be Dr. Sleep. If you've looked at the name of this episode, you know that that's exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's been a few changes to how we do things over the years. There's been a lot of changes in our audio quality. We've put the original episode up at the top of our feed with a new introduction from us. I would recommend that you listen to that first because we're going to refer back to some of the things that we talk about in that in this episode because it's a sequel. Uh, This is the first sequel we've done, right? Yeah, I believe so. We did a two-part episode on Steven Universe, which sort of talked about the whole collective work, but we haven't done an episode on one thing and then on the sequel before. We're going to do it with Miss Bourne, but we haven't got there yet. So we're going to take a little bit of a leaf out of the book for what we did of The Shining, where we're going to talk about the book first and just the book as much as possible, and then we'll look at the movie afterwards as an adaptation and how it relates to the book rather than talking about the two in tandem. As much as we can. I will say that while it would probably be helpful to listen to the Shining episode first, if you really don't have the time to listen to a two-hour podcast before another probably hour plus long podcast, you could you'll probably get something out of this without it. But you know, it'll be a fuller experience if you listen to the other one. Yeah, we won't leave you entirely in the dark if you haven't listened to the other one. Don't worry about that. Okay, so we will obviously be spoiling the entirety of the book Doctor Sleep and the movie adaptation of it. And And The Shining and the movie adaptation of that. Yes. If we have any other spoiler warnings, which we may or may not do, we'll throw those in right here. Um, You'll have a little page turn. We'll also do, you know, if there happen to be any content warnings on this episode. There are going to be content warnings on this episode. Are you sure? Yeah. How I mean, many? right off the bat. No, no, let's leave that for the content warning section. Okay. Okay, let's get that page turn sound effect. Hello. I don't think we have any spoiler warnings this week on top of the ones we already mentioned. As far as content warnings, we do have brief discussions about the content of the book, including child abuse and child sexual abuse. We try to avoid getting particularly graphic with that, but it is... A topic of discussion at certain points. We also discuss alcoholism. I think that's pretty much it. Okay, and back to the past. It's a good sound effect, isn't it? Welcome back. You want to do a summary of the work? Dr. Sleep continues on from the end of The Shining. It starts off with Danny and his mom living in Florida, and Danny realizes that the ghosts from the Overlook, particularly the woman from room 217, has come back to haunt him. And um, his mom calls Dick Halloran to come and help because Danny won't speak. And she knows that Dick can communicate with him anyway. And Dick Halloran explains to Danny that he also was haunted by ghosts as a child that he had to trap. And his grandmother taught him how you trap those kind of spirits that keep coming back. So Danny learns how to do that. And then we flash forward to him as an adult, where he has developed similar alcoholism issues to his dad, not just alcoholism, but also rage and getting into fights and things like that, the kinds of messes that his father would get into when he was drinking. And we see him 
hit like his rock bottom type of situation where he makes some really shitty choices, but we also then see him move on from that and turn things around, get into AA with the help of a person that he meets who has a little bit of The Shining, kind of like Dick Halloran had mentioned to Danny, like a lot of people have a greater or lesser extent of one. And so because of that, this guy takes a chance on Dan. Dan ends up establishing a pretty good life for himself as an orderly in this like New England town where he helps people who are at hospice peacefully transition on and uh, die peacefully and with dignity. And this is a way that he ends up turning around not just his alcoholism, but like his experience of The Shining. The whole time that this is happening, particularly the whole time he's sort of turning his life around, we're also seeing him develop a psychic connection with a little girl named Abra, who also has The Shining, but like even more powerfully than Dan. And this is really astounding because Dan himself is like, really unusually powerful, um, as Dick Halloran says. So she, through her ability, finds out that there are psychic predators out there who track down and torture and kill kids with The Shining. And because she found them, because of her psychic awareness of them torturing another kid, they then find out she exists and start hunting for her. So she and Dan and a few of their support network end up tracking down and taking down the true knot eventually that confrontation and the like final final conclusion of that has to happen back at the overlook hotel of course because it's following on from the shining and so it brings everything full circle i think that's pretty much it Mm -hmm. okay let's get into it so i think maybe the best place to start with this book is going to be to talk about intergenerational trauma it was certainly a large aspect of the original book and I think they've carried it on in this book in a really satisfying way. I think so. Yeah. And it comes all the, it goes all the way through. It's something that it opens with and something that it closes with very clearly. Yeah. I would say Doctor Sleep is a very faithful sequel to the original book, which isn't surprising. It's the same person that wrote it. Mm-hmm. I don't think that there's anything that appears in this book that doesn't make sense with the previous one. Mm-hmm. So in The Shining, we have... Jack Torrance and Danny Torrance with this sort of specter of Jack's father somewhere in there. Yeah. It's clear that Jack is a lot like his father, both in violence and in alcoholism. Mm -hmm. The book opens definitely with a Dan Torrance who is on track to become Jack Torrance. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with all those same coping mechanisms of working to, you know, get past the problems that he has by drinking a lot. He ends up in bar fights. He wakes up regretting having beaten someone up with a pool cue the night before. And it's kind of reminiscent of Jack's own, like, regret of having broken Danny's arm. Obviously not quite the same level of things there. Well, to me, it was more reminiscent of him regretting having assaulted that... Well, he didn't necessarily regret assaulting the student, but regretting ruining his teaching position by assaulting that student. Mm. and feeling like that was a mistake where he, you know, is ruining the good things that he had going for him. And it's something that Dan reflects on is like that he has to keep moving because he's got to dodge the legal problems that might come from having assaulted someone and that this isn't the first time that this kind of thing has happened. And so you get that sense that this is something that he and Jack both had a habit of getting into fights and like kind of hoping it would blow over. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of points where Dan's like talks about jobs where he's lost them because he got very drunk and didn't turn up for a couple of days. Yeah. Like waking up three days later type sort of hangovers. Yeah. And even like right before he turns things around, like after his rock bottom, he goes, he steals a homeless person's blanket, which is pretty low, but to also sleep rough because he's not in a position to have any better thing to do and it's very clear this isn't the first time that he's been in a situation where he was really desperate and had to sleep outside and so this is a situation where like he has developed a very unstable existence through protracted alcoholism yeah and it is just that sort of general through line and framing device that you see where that this came from jack is there for a lot of it in that he reflects on how he is like his father 
but at the same time, his working through things in Alcoholics Anonymous, a big part of it is, I'm not a drunk because my father was a drunk. It's mm -hmm. drunk because I drink, or whatever the phrase is that's used. Like, mm -hmm. it's not the passing blame off for, onto other people thing. That it was still a choice that he's making. Yeah, and... I appreciate that he also kind of pushes back on that and it's like, but there is a hereditary component though. Like that is an important aspect. Yeah. And yeah, I know Alcoholics Anonymous kind of hand waves that away and really wants you to take like full, complete personal responsibility. And I get why that's important, but also it's hereditary. Like, and, and, yeah. and me coming from the perspective I have, I, I appreciate that because it is both, you know, it's not just one of those things. Right. Not everyone whose parent is an alcoholic is going to become an alcoholic, but also you're a lot more likely to, and there are reasons for that. Yeah. We see that come through in other aspects as well with this sort of, it's really only in the first half of the book and then it springs in a little bit later. We'll get into that a little bit more in a bit, but the sort of sadism and cruelty that goes with the violence that he perpetrates. Yeah. Like in the moment, like in the flashbacks that you get of the bar fight and things, like there's not regret there. His first reaction when the character Fred Carling, who's an orderly at the hospice, has manhandled one of the patients there, or mm -hmm. residents, I think is the term mm -hmm. they use. And bruised him. His first reaction is to go and beat the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. And it's an impulse that he has to work against to not do that. So I think we can talk about all of that a lot more as we go on, but I think mm -hmm. those are important framing things to understand everything that's going on, is that it is about this... Is Dan becoming his father as a question and his mm -hmm. attempts not to? Yeah, well, I think a huge part of it is acknowledging the legacy that you get from your family that might be really toxic and things that you don't want to live up to. You may inherit these tendencies and these inclinations to become an alcoholic, to be cruel and hurtful and to lash out in anger and to take joy in other people's pain. But just because you've inherited or learned those tendencies doesn't mean that you have to just accept them as a thing that you can't do anything about and just give in to those darker impulses. Like there are other choices that you can make and that you should make so that you can avoid visiting more pain on other people and passing that legacy even further. Yeah. And it's interesting because if you go into this reading, having read The Shining, then all of the source of that is very clear. I think that there's some choices in the early chapters that are intended to draw attention to the idea of things coming from your parents, whether by actions or not. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that we both have some problems with these scenes. Yeah. I think I understand why they're there from a storytelling element, but I wish it had been done differently. Mm -hmm. I agree. So what we're talking about here is some, I'm guessing we gave a hint at this in the content warnings, these sort of childhood traumas that have been inflicted on people. As I say, Dan's childhood trauma is the entirety of The Shining, mm -hmm. whereas we're introduced to a character called Snakebite Andy, who's one of the true not, and we revisit Dick Halloran and he imparts some of his life story to Dan. And both of those deal with some fairly fairly graphically described fairly horrific child abuse mm -hmm. and particularly graphically described well for dick halloran's story graphically described childhood sexual abuse and for andy explicitly stated childhood sexual abuse and then graphically described revenge of a sexual abuse nature or of a sexual violence nature where she perpetrates sexual violence on her abuser who is her father and it's not necessarily like the graphicness of the revenge is less problematic to me and that might say something about me but the particularly the graphic descriptions of dick halloran's stories and the fact that dick halloran is in that period of time recounting that story or those stories to danny who's supposed to be like seven at the time yeah was a choice that I had a lot of problems with. Like I had a lot of problems with including it in general and the detail it is because it can be the sort of thing where you might unintentionally be pandering to a pedophile audience. Yeah. But also because it 
doesn't say anything good to me about Dick Halloran's boundaries with getting into that kind of detail with a seven-year-old, even a seven-year-old with The Shining. Like, he's going to have enough intrusive and age-inappropriate content dumped into his brain without someone giving him the context for those kinds of nightmares. And so I felt that was really inappropriate with the way it was handled, and I think it could have been done a lot more delicately with maybe hints at what Dick was thinking that maybe Danny didn't fully understand, but not with the clear and graphic description from Dick to Danny. Yeah, and they tried to kind of hand wave that a little bit by having Dick say something to the effect of like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be telling you this, except that you could just look in my mind and see it anyway, except that there's a difference of agency there. Yeah, if Danny found it by accident or because he was digging, that's different. That's your seven-year-old finds your porn. It's not you showing it to him. Yeah. Um. I mean, that's a different thing, obviously, but you know what I mean? Like, it's the difference between you voluntarily exposing somebody to something and them encountering it incidentally. Yeah. And also, we can assume that Dick has some level of power to shut people out of areas based on his own strength of the Shining. Right. And particularly with something that's sensitive, like you, and in that moment, especially if he were being careful to try to not expose Dan to that stuff, he would presumably be able to then feel or tell if Danny was prying and be like, no, really respect my privacy, please. Like, yeah. Uh, you don't need to know that. Bad enough, I'm haunted by this. You don't need to as well. Yeah. But so I've, I found that very upsetting. Like, I don't agree with that choice. Agree. I think you can get the point across of the kind of horror he experienced without doing that. And then the snake by Andy stuff. Well, before we get onto the snake by okay. Andy, I understand why it's there from a storytelling point of view mm-hmm. of the wanting to show how these ideas are passed on and how these traumas are passed on, Mm -hmm. and how doing that at that point in the story sets up those ideas for the whole thing. But it didn't need to be done the way that you say, as you you say. But I don't think narratively there's any problem with having that there. I think that it's all about the way that it was handled. Yeah, no, I understand that. Like, I don't think that we shouldn't include childhood sexual abuse as a part of a character's backstory, especially as something that they had to learn to overcome and that someone experienced and got through and it didn't define their life. Because Dick Halloran does move on and he has a full and rich and interesting life that's in no way impeded by having had that experience or at least not functionally. You know what I mean? Like he he moved on from there. The thing is that with both Dick and Andy and Jack and Danny... What they take away from their childhood trauma is a sort of thirst for vengeance and like people getting their comeuppance for what they do. We see that very explicitly with Andy. We do with Andy. I'm not sure I see it as clearly with Dick, though. It's more subtle, but it's there. Just the do you care if they disappear? Yeah, thing? it's it's the pleasure in it's the pleasure in what he did to his grandfather, which I understand. But he clearly still carries that kind of a feeling because five-year-old Danny said, or he might be a little bit older at that point, but I think he's supposed to be that age, says, okay, so I lock these spirits in a box in the back of my brain. Do they die? And as you say, he responds, do you care? And that's then a phrase that is echoed later in the book by Rose. Yeah, the villain, the villain, yeah. When she turns Andy and Andy questions, am I still human? Her response is, do you care? Yeah, but with Dick, I don't know that it's necessarily that he has a similar type of cruel impulse. I don't think it's as explicit. If he does, it's very narrowly defined. And it's not just generally to anyone who's been a jerk to him or whatever. It's like this particular person who tormented him and his father like, and made his life a living hell even after he died. and. I also think there is something about that coming from a point in his life when he probably had a much less developed, like, sense of morality and perspective on the world. And being called back to those moments, it does kind of bring you back to an earlier point, I think, in your moral development in certain ways, where you might tap into a somewhat colder, you know, less open perspective, because that's the frame of mind you had to be in to lock that person in that box. 
Right, but I think that that informs everything else that we see in the book because we get so little of Dick Halloran. Mm -hmm. Like, we get a lot of him in the first few pages, but then he's not really a major character throughout the book. So if you're looking at it for what purpose it serves within the story, Mm -hmm. it's highlighting that Danny's mentor, like, he's kind of the closest thing there is to a father figure, Mm -hmm. is giving this message to a small child of, if someone has done terrible things to you, it's okay to do terrible things to them and not care about it. Yeah, that's fair. Andy, mm-hmm. you were going to say something before, and I cut you off, sorry. Yeah, well, I was going to say, like, the way that the trauma Andy experiences that leads her to have these particular hangups about, like, being a man hater and, like, assuming that all men are pedophiles, basically, and deserve whatever torture she wants to inflict on them because she can. The way that it's handled, I don't, it's not as explicitly described in as gross terms and things the the way that Dick Halloran's is, but it comes like immediately on the heels of that scene. And so it doesn't have to, to feel gratuitous and gross. And like the whole opening of this book is trading in a kind of cheap way on the horror of childhood sexual abuse. In a way that kind of pissed me off. Like, I, I would not have finished reading the book if I weren't reading it for the podcast because I don't like that kind of experience being used that way. Yeah. And if it was manipulative in a way that I resented and in a way that I found kind of offensive as a social worker because I've met and known and worked with a lot of kids with experiences like that. And I, it felt cheap and... I don't know, just wrong to use that to sell books. Yeah, I agree. I I don't like the first hundred pages or so of this book, which is a decent chunk of the book. It's not a book that I would have pushed on with if not for the fact that it was a sequel to The Shining. I was fascinated by what they were going to do with that and it kept me moving through it. I think the book after that is very good. But I, think I, would, that, I would agree. I think those two things together, right at the start, it is too much. Yeah, and I think it's, not a thing that would be that hard to correct from my perspective again like i said before pretty much just remove a lot of the excruciating detail in dick halloran talking which would be a lot more appropriate for the scene because danny is like five or seven years old something like that not of an age where dick should be going into that kind of detail with him about it and if you had just hinted at it let the reader fill in the details and just carried forward the idea that this is a horrible thing that happens and unfortunately it was a thing that happened to dick but not get into the details i think it would have been fine yeah and honestly it would have made me think better of of dick as a character because it that was probably one of the things i didn't like about it too like the other stuff is a lot bigger as to why i was like no i don't like this and i don't appreciate stephen king doing this in this book but also it tarnished my perspective of dick halloran and his ability to have appropriate boundaries with a child yeah so yes i think that that should have been handled differently i do understand why those two character stories are there because of the different roles that they do serve within the storytelling Mm -hmm. i think dix is formative for danny and i think andy is representative of what happens if you don't have the right support around that yeah I agree. And I understand, again, I understand why hers comes right on the heels of the scene with Dick Halloran because Dick's story is a story of he's abused in that way and he finds out it's something that's been ongoing in his family. It's something that his father experienced and presumably other relatives of his. But he had a trusted adult that he could go to about it after his grandfather died, but still a trusted adult he could go to who helped him move on. And Dan and Andy didn't. Yeah. And so she had to take matters into her own hands without any sort of guidance on how to do that in any sort of healthy way. So to get back to more sort of how the intergenerational aspect of it functions, Mm -hmm. um, we'll sort of circle back around to how the alcoholism represents a lot of things. Because I want to talk about that in tied in with Alcoholics Anonymous as how that fits within the story. Mm -hmm. But just looking at that sort of anger, violence, arrogance, sadism that sort of came to define Jack Torrance Mm -hmm. and is at risk of defining Dan Torrance at the start of the book. Right. And how that goes throughout the story and throughout so many of the characters. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's important to bring up at this point that one of the big twists toward the end is that you find out that Dan and Abra are related. Yes. That Jack Torrance is actually Abra's grandfather. Jack had a fling with his teaching assistant back at that school, the same one where he broke the kid's arm. And she got pregnant and had Lucia, who is Abra's mom. And it's established that Lucia has, has some of the shining and Abra is like, crazy shining and jack had the shining just again not that much yes it does work very much to define the shining as a hereditary thing Mm -hmm. which does help to drive this idea of the intergenerational trauma as these things that are passed down in our original episode you talked to me for a while and sort of brought me around to the idea that jack did have some of the shining I didn't really see it at first. This book really, I think, does confirm that it does have that. So I'm going to give you uh, 20 seconds on the clock to just gloat. Yeah, I was right. It was pretty cool. Like I'm, I was very happy to have that confirmed when I was reading the book. I forget how they confirm it. And it's not like it's super explicitly stated, but it is definitely confirmed, which is pretty awesome. I wish I had like a thing I could call to mind of like yeah, that, exactly that, where it that's happens. That's for 20 seconds. Do you remember exactly how it is so the confirmed? one that, well, the one that we came up with when we were talking as a sign that no, this is a thing. Mm-hmm. I think that Dan does mention it at some point, but there's also Abra rubs her mouth when mm-hmm. she's stressed, mm-hmm. which is something that we see Jack do originally when mm-hmm. he needs a drink. And it's the same gesture because Dan recognizes it without quite knowing what he's recognizing. Yeah. Abra never met Jack. Lucia never met Jack. There's no way that that motion could have been passed by visuals. Mm -hmm. It must have happened. And it's not like that tick would be a genetic trait. It must be tied to some element of shiningness in there. Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's definitely true. But I don't know that that's evidence that Jack has the shining. That's evidence that Abra has it. But it is Oh, stated... in that case, we need to take your 20 seconds back. Now, it is, <laughs> it is stated elsewhere. Like, yeah. I think Dan does acknowledge that it was probably a part of why his dad was an alcoholic also, because that's part of why Dan is, is to dull the shining. It is referenced yeah. periodically in somewhat vague terms, but it's there. It's there, and I was right. So there. Uh, you have extended your 20 seconds. Uh, I'm, I'm very upset. When you edit this, if you could edit that down to 20 seconds, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I'll see what I can do. You're not going to, are you? Probably not. Okay. Anyway, so there are certain traits that we do see carried throughout. To my knowledge, we don't ever see Lucia drinking or anything. To be honest, we don't see a huge amount of Lucia. We don't. Well, we hear more about her from other people, and she is in group scenes where she's referred to. But one of the through lines is like there's constant mentions of her having a temper and her being really stubborn and there being a point where when she's like built up a head of steam and there's just no getting through or gainsaying her at all, like it's her way or the highway and you just don't even want to mess with it. And it's very similar to Jack Torrance. It's a thing that then you see with Abra. And it it's pretty well spelled out at the end that... All of these things are part of the legacy of the Torrance line is that tendency toward getting into a state of just all there is is rage. Yeah. And struggle to control that in any way. Mm -hmm. And so and a streak of sadism and like feeling satisfied at hurting another person who has made you angry when in that kind of a state. And that gets fairly thoroughly explored in both jack in the shining and dan in particularly the first half of the book and then it's him fighting against that later on in the book well and then with abra too yeah and i think that's so important that then it brings it around like because he's had a chance to reflect on that he's able to call her attention to it when she starts falling into the same traps but the thing is is that when it first starts coming up dan's maybe a little bit taken aback but really what we see is her joy at hurting Rose Mm -hmm. and it's hard to see that as a problem because Rose is such a terrible person in her ways Mm -hmm. that it's that same well is Dick Halloran really vengeful or is that fine well mm." as it progresses it starts to become her being a troublesome teenager at Mm -hmm. the end of the book we see that she has 
gone to a party, had some alcohol, been caught having had alcohol, and got so angry that she's broken all the dishes in a cabinet with psychic powers. We see Dan and we see Jack as angry men. Mm -hmm. We see Abra as a child who might not know better and then as an angry teenager. Mm -hmm. In Lucia, it's very much present, but Mm -hmm. it's brushed off as... Oh, you know, it's my wife and she's got to that point where you, there's no reasoning with her now. Yeah. It's just perceived in a very different way. Mm-hmm. And I do think that there's something to that. I mean, there's obviously some sexism there with how we perceive men and women's anger and how men's anger just seems inherently more threatening. And a part of that is because our society makes a lot of excuses for and enables a lot of the more destructive aspects of men's anger. And Things are often apologized for, excused. Whereas with women's anger, I think it is often taken less seriously, just in general. I mean, they're both taken, not taken seriously, but in different ways and in ways that are differently toxic. Whereas with women, it's a way to minimize and ignore like legitimate concerns, which Lucia often has in these periods of time. Like she has is making good points a lot of the time. Like it's about her mom's health and like trying to make, reasonable arrangements for everyone to be okay and like you know there might be two sides to that issue but framing it as a point where well she's just mad and you just kind of have to let her have this one because otherwise it's just going to be a long night or whatever is kind of ignoring the fact that like no it's not just that she's not reasonable at this point it's also that she has valid concerns does that make any sense yeah So as far as people who are able to progress in the book, we're really looking at Dan and Abra. Mm -hmm. Dan's anger is very clearly shown as a problem from the start. Mm -hmm. And we get so much of the story from inside of his head. And he is so self-aware of his problems and how to handle them that we see that process of, I really want to go and beat the shit out of Fred Carling, but that's not the right thing to do, so I shouldn't do that. I do really want to, though. No, no, I guess I shouldn't. Yeah. We don't get that with Abra because she doesn't have the outside thing. So we need a broader storytelling stroke to be able to show us that these are bad things to think, to Mm -hmm. sort of frame out that conversation that Dan and Abra have later, which were given in Rose and the True Knot, but primarily Rose. Rose takes so much pleasure in the pain of others especially vengeance when abra has hurt her her reaction is i don't care what's the correct thing to do i'm gonna fucking kill her yeah that's just what's gonna happen or i'm going to torture her for the rest of her life yeah the true not are a group of people who are literally sustained by torturing people yep that's how they are able to survive they don't just take pleasure they take sustenance from it Mm -hmm. And with Rose, it does go to beyond like she has that same sort of blind rage where she doesn't see anything but satisfying her vengeance. And that's even when people in her community that she's responsible for taking care of are dying. And like the better call is to let it go. Move the fuck on. And she won't. And the rest of her community are seeing this and are losing faith in her leadership and are breaking off. Because they see that she's put her vengeance over the welfare of the community. And while you know, their villains are all really terrible and stuff, like that's still an example of bad leadership. And I think it's, it's supposed to be sort of this icon of like, this is bad, as you're saying. Right. Particularly because she's another point of view character. Yes. But I think that it's, you said blind rage. And I think it is that foil to Dan's self-awareness. Rose thinks that she's very self-aware, but she's sort of caught up in this concept of true, not exceptionalism. Yeah, she's too convinced of her own superiority in a similar way to Jack Torrance. Yeah, there's no point in the book until perhaps the very, very, very end where she's like, oh, maybe I'm going to lose to these people. It's always, you know, she's just some little girl Mm -hmm. and just some, the, the rubes. There are these... Humans who don't have all of our powers, some of them have got a bit of power that we can eat, but they're no match for us ever. Several of her friends are killed by these people. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of her not are killed by these people, and she's still like, yep, but I've got them. (laughs) Yeah, it's 
amazing. It's also, there's definitely a level of self-deception there, though, because a part of her does know to be threatened by Abra because she lies to Crow about the possibility of turning her. She thinks to herself she doesn't want anyone in her community with Abra's kind of power because she knows it would threaten her standing as being the leader of the group. So a part of her does know enough to know that Abra is a threat, but she still refuses to fully acknowledge or accept that while Abra is still in a fully human state and hasn't been turned. It's like, if we turned her, then she'd be a threat because she'd have that power and be one of us. But until she's one of us, I can write her off in my mind as not a threat. Yeah. To her detriment, because writing her off as not a threat obviously doesn't work out well for her, but... (laughs) It's a similar kind of self-deception to what we see Jack engage in, where, like, he keeps lying to himself about what actually happened with the kid at the school, even in his own point of view to the reader. He keeps lying about it, keeps lying about it. Little details he sort of cops to over time, and eventually you can really put together what actually happened. But he'd been lying in his own brain, his own point of view, for most of The Shining. And you see Rose doing the same thing, but about her confidence basically and the superiority of the true not so as a sort of tangent to this that will bring it will bring us back around okay I promise maybe if we look at the villains in the two books we have rose slash the true not who are these embodiment of evil going to hunt down children to survive off of anger and sadism mm-hmm. and then we have in the shining the overlook hotel this sort of vague spirit of the building the place is just evil there's spirits inside but the overlook itself is what takes over jack and has him slowly lose his mind and try and kill wendy and danny i think that you can make an argument that they're almost the same villain oh definitely i mean they both very much support my theory from the big question that we asked about like where does evil come from and i was arguing that In The Shining, it really all comes down to selfishness, that it's all these selfish, self-centered actions where you're putting yourself and your comfort first and fuck everyone else are how everyone gets to be a horrible spirit at the Overlook Hotel and how Jack ends up becoming such a monster up until he realizes it and puts someone else first. And it's the same thing here. The true not have decided that the torture and death of children is perfectly tolerable to them if it means it serves their selfish interests of staying young and healthy forever yeah we don't get a redemption of rose and the true knot in (laughs) dr sleep the redemptive quality that they have is that they die Mm -hmm. and then they're gone and that's because there's no room for those people to be like oh i'm sorry well, they passed... I've seen the error of my ways. Well, not only that, but like if they did, they would then have to come to terms with dying because the only way they can survive is by continuing to make those selfish choices to torture other people so that they can live. So if they ever did decide, oh shit, I've become a monster and I can't live like this, they would literally cease to live like that. Yeah. And so they've passed a point of no return as far as their survival goes. To be honest, I think that parallels the ghosts in the Overlook, too, because now they've died and they can't make a different choice because they're dead. And so they've also passed a point of no return, where they only exist in a form that is stuck in those choices that they already made. Yeah. But in The Shining, we don't get a redemption of the Overlook. Like No. The Overlook's answer in the original book is to die as well. Mm -hmm. The redemption in that book is of Jack Torrance. He gets that redemptive moment at the end when he manages to overcome the Overlook long enough to not kill his son, perhaps a low bar, and to instead go and set the boiler to, ex- or allow the boiler to explode. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that in Doctor Sleep, the person that gets the redemption at the end might also be Jack Torrance. Yeah, well, I don't know that he even needs to be redeemed there. He helps with the final outcome of you know overthrowing rose literally by throwing her off of the overlook overthrowing um yeah okay thank you yeah well he (laughs) the spirit of jack pushes her off the cliff and that's important but again i think his spirit can do that because he already made that unselfish choice before he died yeah it's how he died so quips aside i would say that the book is about 
Dan Torrance working to not become his father. Mm -hmm. And also helps the next generation not, not embody the legacy of the past generations. Right. So at the start of the book, he doesn't have people around him who can help him not become his father. I mean, there's Dick Halloran, sort of, but that's kind of a weird relationship. He ends up in all of those destructive cycles. I think the really big, important part of it is that he is able to come out of that, but it's not ever shown as he did it by his own willpower. No. It's shown that he tries his own willpower, and that's not really enough. Yeah, in the earlier part of the book when he's struggling with alcoholism, like I think it is clarified that he's sworn off drinking lots of times. It hasn't stuck, much like it didn't stick with Jack. It's only when he has a community where he has a friend who takes a chance on him, Bill, introduces him and kind of gets him in with a community that can support him, that things start turning around. And at that point, he's also mentally connected to someone else who has The Shining, and so he feels less alone in that as well. It's a a whole entire support network. That comes later as time goes on. I mean, at, at the beginning of his AA meetings, Abra is a baby who I don't think is as supportive as she could be. No, but he has that connection. He doesn't even necessarily know that it's there, but he does have one. Yeah. And so I think there's a part of his mind. I mean, just we know from The Shining that there was a part of his mind that was a little bit more clear about the world that he called Tony, a part of him that was more perceptive than his conscious mind maybe knew. And in his initial AA meetings, when he's still kind of getting started on making a fresh start, he's psychically connected to Abra, part of him knows he's connected to somebody. I mean, it seems it's part of why he stops in that town is because he sees Tony in the window of the boarding house or of the hospice. He sees Tony in that window, like a subconscious part of his mind that's like the most clearly linked to his shining knows that this is a place where he'll have a community and people who love him. Yeah. And it's presumably important within that that Tony is the start of his link to Abra as well. Because mm-hmm. Abra first off starts reaching out to Tony, not to Dan. Right. But then Tony's presence in the hospice window and the hospice being the place where Dan comes to grips with what his shining is and how he can use it for good. Yeah. And how it can be a way to connect with people. Yeah. One of the things that he says makes him drink so much is seeing death flies on people. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really important note that he doesn't see death flies on the people in Rivington House. It's a place where, at least with his help, death comes peacefully. Mm-hmm. And he does find that calling of helping people go through that time in as nice of a way as you can, I guess. Yeah, I mean, he's learned that his gift can, instead of just being a way for him to interact with death as something horrible, to be a part of helping people die with dignity, which is a very different thing. Yeah. And it sort of closes the circle on he's not able to get his life sorted without the help of people that he meets through AA and a friend in Billy and things. And then the correct thing for him to do moving on from that is to help other people. And well, I mean, I think you sort of helped me see this scene in the right light. At the very end of the book, he's got to a point where he can swallow and push down his anger and make sure he does the right thing to help people, regardless of who they are, Mm -hmm. and sort of set aside those wants of vengeance. You're talking about the Fred Carling scene? Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned before there's a point where he wants to beat the crap out of another orderly because he bruised one of the people at the hospice, and he doesn't beat the crap out of him, but he really wants to, and he really hates that guy. But at the end, that guy gets hit by a truck or something. I forget exactly what happens, but he's he's also dying now and way before his time. And he's scared. And there's a part of Dan that doesn't not like this guy. And he knows that that guy was kind of an asshole and sometimes hurt people who were helpless for no good reason just because he was irritated. But he sets that aside and does what he does for anyone dying in Rivington House and helps him move forward in a dignified way and reassures him that it will be okay. And I think it's interesting that there's a very humanizing moment for Fred Carling in that section, in that he's dying and his biggest concern is what's going to happen to my dog. Yeah. Um, I think it's something where 
a lot of people can probably relate to that as an idea. Mm -hmm. But it also shows how lonely his life might be, that that's the only concern, and that he thinks that if he dies, then nobody would go and check on this dog. Yeah, but I also think it is somewhat humanizing in that, like, yeah, he was kind of shitty, and it's never okay to abuse someone in your care. But also that, like, we don't know if that was, like, part of a pattern of his behavior or if it was one time that he did that and maybe he felt horrible about it afterward, you know? Like, I think that a lot of us have had cruel impulses that we may have even acted upon and we may have moved past that point. I don't think that that kind of sadistic streak that you see reflected in Dan's thoughts and in Jack's thoughts is alien to the people who read these books and watch these movies. I think it's a big part of why people like them so much is because it is an acknowledgement of some of the uglier parts of human nature without looking away from it, acknowledging that, you know, you're not alone in sometimes having those kinds of really fucked up impulses and thoughts and feelings. And that that's not all you are. You're not the worst things that you've ever done. You're not the worst things you've ever felt. You can acknowledge that you made the wrong choice in acting on some of those things and you can make better choices moving forward. Yeah. And I think that that's really well spelled out in the final scene that you get of Dan and Abra talking, mm -hmm. which actually comes just before the Fred Carling scene, where it, it really does sort of lay out the meaning of the book very heavily. It's very hard to miss. It is, but I like that because yeah. it, I think it avoids some of the issues you can have if you're a little too subtle with stuff like that. I think it is important to spell certain messages out. <laughs> yeah. Where Dan is sitting down and saying to Abra, like, you have these impulses. I had these impulses. Your grandfather had these impulses. Like Your great grandfather it, yeah. had those impulses. And, and they all the acted on them. shit out of your great grandmother. Yeah. He was in it. No. But it's not a problem to have them. It's a problem to act on them. Yeah. And, and, to, and to excuse them also, I think, is yeah. a big part of it. To think that's okay. It's not okay to have those feelings necessarily. It's normal to have those feelings. It doesn't make you a bad person, but you have to know that that's a thing you're capable of and you have to do what you can to act against it. Yeah. I think the Fred Carling scene is an important part of Abra actually hearing that though, because he, she's been sort of like writing off what he's saying, like kind of trying to not hear it when he's explaining, hey, you have this legacy, it sucks, but it's there. You have these feelings, you have this sadistic streak. It's not going away. You come by it honestly and you need to learn how to deal with it. And she's kind of in this teenagery, like, I know, I know, whatever, like... You're ruining my birthday. Yeah, get off my back kind of situation. But then he gets the call to go and help Fred Carling, this guy he really doesn't like, who's kind of been a sadistic ass himself die peacefully and she sees him make the choice to be the bigger person and not be cruel to that person in their hour of need and let them suffer because like she says to him like you don't even like that guy or something like that he's like yeah but that's not the point yeah it's a thing i can do and it's a thing i should do the uh the hot take from stephen king do the right thing yep a little more complex than that obviously but Okay. But, but it means that he's then showing her rather than just telling her. Yeah. And I think it's harder for her to ignore the message when he's then about to go and live that example right yeah. there in such a meaningful way. And it's nice that at the end you can see that Abra is going to have that support system. You know, her odd support system of her two parents, her pediatrician, and her uncle that no one knew existed until... Anyway... Okay, we want to talk about a couple of the storytelling elements. Sure. Alcoholics Anonymous is really important to this book. Mm -hmm. I, I have never attended a meeting or read the book, so I'm going off of what Stephen King puts in here, and I'm assuming that it's truthful. He has spoken in the past about his experience with Alcoholics Anonymous, um, so I, I trust him. Yeah, but it is a consistent through line through the recovery of Dan and his ongoing recovery, and the fact that like even when he's got a stable life and he hasn't been drinking for years it's still a process like it doesn't end ever yeah but there's quotes from the book and lots of references to the different steps in-depth philosophical discussions of like what it really means to do them properly and things like that and what makes different parts of that process difficult it really is a thing that permeates 
the majority of the book from the point that he starts going. But I think it's something where it's consistently there to underline some of the messages in the book and some of the parts of the story that could go a little bit unseen otherwise. Like the importance that Dan doesn't go and do things alone. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's the 12th step visit that they talk about where it's if you're going to go and do an intervention, you don't Mm -hmm. go by yourself because that's how you end up having a drink with that person. Right. You go with someone else to help you because you can't do it alone. Right. And there's such a strong emphasis on community there, Mm -hmm. which I think is then mirrored in Dan has a moment where he thinks about how different things would have been if Jack had had access to something like that. It sort of acknowledges that Wendy didn't know about it or she would have tried to get him to go to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, what would that have been like? It is something he thinks about, like, what if he'd done that instead of going to the Overlook? Like, yeah, their lives would have been completely or could have been completely different. And I think there's a part of him he does acknowledge, like, maybe it wouldn't have worked out, but also maybe it would have. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, going to the Overlook was probably not going to work well anyway. Because the alcoholism is something that is exploited in Jack by the Overlook. It's not the reason that he kills everyone. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't want to make it seem seem like, you know, if, if you're an alcoholic, you're probably going to kill your family. It's yeah, not what I'm saying. That's not Please don't saying. clip that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's more of a, a thought exercise of dance, of how, what might have been, basically. Yeah. A lot of the community stuff is tied to AA. Characters like... Casey is this sort of constant mentor, John as someone who is a plot relevant character, but is also the person that he can call from the lot of the cowboy bar or whatever the place is. That... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that there are, there's more than one person he can call when he's tempted to fall off the wagon. Yeah. When he didn't feel up to talking to Casey because he didn't want to have a certain conversation, Casey's been trying to push him to reveal his rock bottom story because it's like an important milestone or something. Dan's not ready to do that. And since they recently had that conversation, he doesn't feel comfortable reaching out to his sponsor because he, it's a community. It's not like he only knows Casey. Yeah. He can call John instead. And so he's not alone in that moment, even when he really feels alone. And even when he first gets brought to AA, it's because Somebody in the small community he has managed to put together, which is pretty much just Bill, finds him because he has a bit of The Shining and takes him to Casey to introduce him to that support system. It's an illustration of the fact that like he was only successful in any of that because other people were there for him. Yes. The other thing is that it serves as a really useful measure of time. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of moments where it's like, well, you know, such and such was happening and you know, Dan was standing in a room getting a chip with a number five on it. He's like, okay, so it's been five years. Yeah, and that's one of two consistent and interesting ways of marking time in the book and sort of centering the reader in time. That one is centering you in where all these things are happening in relation to Dan and in relation to his life. But there are also a lot of references to the larger culture and like the timeline of the United States history, particularly references to presidents and events like 9-11 and things like that explicitly there so that you have a frame of reference for like how long the true knot has been doing certain things and how long it's been between certain events and all of that so that you have a larger context and it's something that kind of makes it feel more like maybe this shit is happening in the real world somewhere like you're reading this on your couch in 2020 and if dan hadn't killed them all with abra the true not might still be roaming around. They were in the 80s, you well, know, during no, the whatever administration. No, because the true not, like, some of them break off, so they could still be out there. Point uh, being, it's <laughs> it's a way to connect it to the real world in a way. As yeah. So there are these two devices. There's the one connecting the reader to the real world and the events in the book to the real world and also the way to help the reader track what's going on in relation to, to Dan. Yeah, I mean, with the connection to the real world, there's a couple of scenes where it's spoken directly to the reader and it's, you will see these RVs driving around and you'll see this kind of a person in that truck stop and you'll think, well, they're kind of annoying. Um, Oh, all the restrooms are taken up. Well, no, those people that you see all the time are actually these horrible monsters. It's the taking the normal and making it horrific. Yeah, well, they or they might be. And so it's like, oh, so you have to wonder. No, all of them. (laughs) 
Yeah, all of the RV people are secretly psychic vampires. That is what Stephen King is saying. No, I, he's he very clearly does say like sometimes it's those people. Like the nefariousness of them is that they blend in so well that nobody looks twice. They think they know who they are, and so they don't see anything else. I did have a bit of a pause about the inclusion of the 9-11 stuff in there. I thought it was a good illustration of the storm chasing that the True Not do in between torture victims. Yeah, I took a moment, and I came to the conclusion that it was a good choice to put it in there. There's the part of me that's like, eh, capitalizing on that. Eh. But it's not like it's a Nicolas Cage film about a firefighter in 9-11 or something that is a little bit more crass and was also made far too close to the time. But it's written, I think this was written in 2013-ish, give or take. Don't check me on that one. And it's, it's such a defining point of American history at this point mm -hmm. that to write something that took place in the early 2000s and didn't reference it might almost be an oversight. Especially when you consider that the markers of time that are used make it seem like it should be mentioned, you know? Like, yeah. because it's mentioning specific presidential administrations and things, it would have been weird to not comment on it, particularly as the True Knot is also commenting on the character of, like, the United States population and, like, the way that people behave and the kinds of environment that they're in as far as the people are concerned. And it also, I think, does a good job of fleshing out sort of the mechanics of the steam situation and that it is pain that they are able to draw this sort of psychic energy from. And it's stronger when it's psychic people, but it also works for it to just be masses and masses of tiny particles coming off of like thousands of people. And so they get a sort of a psychic sense of like when big tragedies are going to happen and they start heading there so that they can be there in time they're storm chasing so that they can be there to breathe in the pain of the population when something tragic happens like 9-11 yeah i think the other thing for like real world connections that are interestingly used is that the big push for the true not to have to go after abra and not give up on it at that point is that they have developed measles. Yeah, which is fun with the whole anti-vaxxer situation. That, that's probably something that had been less of a problem, but now it's becoming more of a problem in the United States in certain pockets. Yeah, because they've caught it from a kid in Iowa who hadn't been vaccinated for it and are thinking that the solution might be to get someone that gets steam from someone like Abra who probably has been vaccinated from it. But it's the, the true not are so old Mm -hmm. that that's a threat to them because when they were children, they weren't exactly getting vaccines for these. Because, like, I think we have some debate over how old you remember Grandpa Flick being, but he's at least 500. Yeah, he's one of the really old ones that came over from the continent before people settled the United States. Yeah. And that is something that's established about the True Knot, that before they were nomadic in Europe and other continents. They've moved around the globe, but have been in the U.S. for at least several decades, if not a century or more. Yeah. So I think the last sort of storytelling thing I want to talk about is something that we talked a little bit about in the original episode, which is how The Shining works as a storytelling device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's some stuff that's fairly simplistic to it. There's obviously a certain amount of foreshadowing that happens. Yeah. Um, Dan seeing the hat. That Rose the, the Hat always wears. Yep. The use of death flies as a way to indicate that somebody is going to die. Yeah. And this is something that Dan sees on people who are terminally ill and it freaks him out. And I think it is one of the things that drives... Like, I don't think that the that Doctor Sleep is as much of a horror book as The Shining is. I think The Shining is much scarier. I would agree with that. It's more of an adventure. Yeah. Maybe it's just because of issues that I have, but I think one of the horrors in the book that does stand out a bit more is the use of the flies and the talking about him visiting his mother when she was dying from smoking too much, I think. Lung cancer? Is that I think it? so. Something like that. Yeah. And like talking about her having her face covered in flies so much that he couldn't see her face and that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then that being used as a big setup for the 
ending where he's seeing them on his own face because he's holding on to a whole bunch of cancer in his head. Mm -hmm. Psychic cancer. It makes sense if you read the book. Kind of. (laughs) Which I guess we haven't really talked about Conchetta much. Yeah. Conchetta is Abra's great-grandmother, and she is dying of cancer during the run-up to the end of the book, and Dan visits her, and she gives him her last breath along with her cancer so that he can use it as a weapon against the true knot. And also finds out the details about Jack Torrance and probably being, probably having a half-sister. Mm-hmm. But yeah, ultimately, The Shining serves as a way of controlling the flow of information. Yeah. Which is something that we see done in a lot of sort of very careful ways. Like, I think The Shining is a big part of it, but not all of it. What we do get shown through the book and what we don't is one of the main ways that suspense and mystery is kept up. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, we don't see the conversation with Conchetta about, oh, yes, this guy was probably the guy that my daughter had a child with or oh yes please take my cancer (laughs) Um, the other big one is that you we don't see the decision for crow to get out of the rv yeah and go and hunt abra it's something that sort of comes up later as like wait he's not in this one place oh no he's in the other place but we didn't tell you that despite the fact that you were around for those conversations we just omitted them but I think um, the last thing with The Shining that is very new to this book is the whole process of like turning the wheel and inhabiting other people's minds. Yeah, that's something that Abra figures out how to do that Dan had never tried. He's never tried to see through someone else's eyes before. He's always been a lot more focused on just not seeing other people's thoughts and knowing what's going on with other people. Much more interested in shutting it down, not reaching out. Yeah. It gives a lot of interesting potential to the world and does provide some fun mystery towards the end of like how that's all going to play out. I don't know that I have much more to say about it than that, to be honest. I think it's interesting as an illustration of the way that two people with the same gifts can use them so differently based on their experiences around it, like early in having it. Yeah. Although a large part of Dan's using his gift is not using his gift. Exactly. He uses it to shut things down and to trap things that are intrusive. And Abra has a very different experience. She didn't have a traumatic early life experience that was related to her psychic ability. So she uses it in much more playful ways and much more exploratory ways. She's interested in seeing what she can do and what's going on out there. But Dan is very aware that there are horrifying things out there and he's mostly interested in shielding himself from them. So I think that that's what we want to say about the book as a standalone entity, Mm -hmm. unless you had any last points. No, I think that's good. Which brings us on to the movie. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple of things we need to say first about this is, for one thing, this movie is in a very difficult spot because it is trying to be a sequel to the Stanley Kubrick movie as well as an adaptation of the sequel of the the book and the movie, very different things. I think that they walk some of that line very well. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit. Now, I was very excited for this movie. I knew very little going in. I knew they cast Ewan McGregor as an older Danny Torrance, and I thought that would be great. I think it is. I think that was perfect casting. Wonderful. Um, now, in our first episode, we did sort of talk about the book for a while, and then we spent a lot of time shitting on the movie. And I want to say that we're not going to do that this time. That would be a lie, so I won't say that. Let's let's shit on this movie for it. <laughs> we did really want to like this movie, and we do like things about it. The first half an hour is pretty solid. Yeah, and that is honestly, like, it honestly makes it so much more disappointing. Yeah, it, it reaches a moment, but let, let's, let's be kind to it for a moment. So, first of all, casting all around, I think, was good. Yeah, I would agree. And, like, the actual performances were great. Yeah. Just certain things aren't as well developed, and you can't blame the actors for that if the content's just not there. I thought the actress for Rose was very good. Crow, I think, really portrayed that character well. Billy Freeman and John, both very well cast. I thought the girl playing Abra did a great job Mm -hmm. with what she was given. Yeah, her role... I know we didn't talk about Abra quite as much even when we were talking about the book. 
But I do think she wasn't as well developed in the film either. Well, she's um, not given the space to be developed. Right, exactly. And I feel a little bit bad that we didn't talk as much about her when we were talking about the book. But I think that's because in a large part, she's a part of Dan's journey more than she's the main character. It's weird because it's like about her fight and her triumph. But it's really about Dan. I'm not sure that it's about her fight and her triumph because Dan masterminds it. That's true. And also, I think it's about Dan becoming the person who can help her. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, it's about overcoming the legacy of Jack Torrance and Anthony Torrance and whoever was before him that was a jerk. You know, (laughs) it's about overcoming that family legacy of intergenerational abuse and... Like, that's really what it is about, and she is a part of that. She is an important part of that cycle of starting from a better place as far as that goes. Yeah. The problem is that in the book, she starts being characterized as a baby. Yeah. Like, because there's the stuff where she's playing the piano from her crib with psychic powers, and there's this sort of, like, puckishness to it. And then, like, her mother, like, tells this baby, is like, hey, it really freaks us out when you do that. Can you stop doing it, maybe? And then well, she does it to comfort herself, but not otherwise. Yeah, but to be fair to her mom, she doesn't say that. She's like, it keeps us from sleeping. Yeah. Um, because she doesn't want to make it seem like a thing that's bad to Abra. Right. Like, she doesn't want to freak her daughter out about it. But she also doesn't want the piano playing at two in the morning, because... Trying to sleep, <laughs> right. you know, so. But you, you get those little bits of characterization mm-hmm. very early. In the film, she starts off as already an older child. You get one scene with the magician, mm-hmm. and then you get thrown into the bulk of it. Yeah. Which is the big problem that I do have with the first part of the film that I do like otherwise, is it does feel so rushed. It does. And some stuff is rushed in a way that feels a little cringy, like the Dr. Sleep thing in particular. I know that you were like, no, 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 no. It's way too soon for that when it happened on screen. And so what I'm referring to is Dr. Sleep is the name that the staff at the Helen Rivington house use for Dan because he helps people pass away peacefully in their sleep and they know that about him and they just kind of accept it. In the film, it's sort of like the very first guy that he helps move forward calls him that and it just feels super forced and weird. It comes out of nowhere. There's no good reason for it. And also that man then dies. Yeah. Which means for that name to then be used later, either Dan has gone and said, guy called me Dr. Sleep. Mm. Maybe maybe you should think about calling me that. Or other people started (laughs) calling him that independently. Like there's no way for that knowledge to be spread around. It doesn't work. It it was forced and it... I I hadn't even really thought about that dimension of it. The fact that the the guy like gives him the name and then dies. And so it would have to be Dan getting people to call him that, which is just really weird. I'm like, you know that that would just... Makes his own name tag. Yeah, like that that would just be sad. And other people would just be like, that guy is kind of off. Like, what is that about? Like, the nurses in the book call him Dr. Sleep. And he's like... No, don't call me that. And they're like, no, we're going to keep calling you that. He's like, fine. So, uh, yeah, it might seem like a minor thing. If it wasn't for that, it's also the title of the book, as well as a nickname given to him. It might not be so bad, but it's a good illustration of how they do try and just move through things too quickly at some points. Yeah. But we were going to talk about the good things first. Yeah. And as has happened before when we've done this. Yeah, and it was just that idea of <laughs> Ewan McGregor just going around to the staff at the Rollington House going, I'd like you all to call me Dr. Sleep. <laughs> out of nowhere. It's just so funny to me. <laughs> it's just, I think we all knew that guy in high school. And uh, those nicknames never stick. Uh, oh, I didn't mention the casting. I also thought the guy playing Dick Halloran was really great. Yeah, and that's a hard one to pull off because the actor from The Shining, I think, did a really great job. Like, had so much... Presence. Yeah, so much screen presence where you could tell he was 
really great at what he was doing, even when other people in the scene could not match his level of presence. Yeah. But they removed a lot of the grossness. Yes. And I appreciate that a lot. Um, we had talked before watching the film about the issues with the Dick Heller and sexual assault stuff mm-hmm. and how it would be better to an extent if it was just nodded at or whatever. And in the film they do. Mm-hmm. It's mentioned that like this guy was really bad and he was abusive. Yep. And that's really all that needs to happen and everything that's necessary is communicated. Yeah. Dick is like, yeah, this guy, he was really mean. He hurt people in our family. He died and he still haunted me. And that was, a th- that was a problem, <laughs> you know, like, and that's the point of the story. The point of the story is that Dick Halloran had to learn how to trap ghosts that were following him around as well. Yeah. So that he could teach Danny how to handle the overlooked spirits that are chasing him. He did not need all of the gory details. And then similarly with Snakebite Andy, mm-hmm. um, I think like Rose mentions, oh, like men noticed you and there's a sideways glance and it's moved on from there. Like enough is communicated that you know what, you know that story. You know that something bad happened to Andy when she was too young for any sort of sexual attention. Yeah. And that's it. You don't need, we don't need any details. And Rose is very careful to characterize that as not Andy's fault, that like adults were predators of her when she's too young. Cause that was one of the things like they aged Andy down. So at the point that they're having this conversation, Andy's like 15. So the whole like men have noticed you. And this is Rose picking up on Andy having a man hating situation going on. And Rose is like, that's clearly a thing that you have been through. That is also clearly a thing that is not your fault. Yeah. Which, even though they're the bad guys, like, I appreciate that. You know, and it's also a part of Rose bringing Andy into that community. It's awkward with the aging of Andy because, on the one hand, like, in the book, Andy is in her 30s. Yeah. And, like, her thing is that she picks up guys and then, like, steals from them and cuts their faces and has got this idea that all men are pedophiles. Mm -hmm. In the movie... Andy's much younger and is catfishing people online to find pedophiles Mm -hmm. um, to mutilate and steal from. Yeah. Becomes much more of a vigilante and much less of just all men are assholes because this one person was. Right. But they age her down so much that it breaks the story because Mm -hmm. it doesn't make a lot of sense that Rose would turn a 15 year old. In the book, the youngest of the true knot are. I think still older than that, even having got younger, I think. No, I think that there are some, there's a couple that look like children. Oh, uh, maybe you're right. But they're like, obviously they're like really old because they're true not, but they were turned as children. Okay. Um, or like teenagers or something. Okay. Fair enough. I'm wrong on that. But it does add uh, this other element of grossness because it means that she's, being turned in a position where she doesn't really have enough consent. Yeah, I or think. much of a perspective on life to make that sort of decision. If they'd made her like 20, but a young looking 20, where she could still be doing her catfishing thing. It would have worked just fine. But yeah. as it is, then you've basically made this child one of the bad guys, and then she gets killed off. Yeah, and also in the book, she's turned in the 80s. And then, like, 30 to 40 years pass. So she she's, like, in her mid-60s by that point. She still looks like she's 30. But in the movie, that time doesn't pass. She's chip turned in whatever year it is. Pretty immediately. Yeah, yeah, like, around the time that then they end up going after Abra not long after. Yeah, so. the, per- the person that the good guys are killing is a 15-year-old. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a problem. But again, we did the same thing where we were trying to talk about the things we liked and then we ended up veering off into the things that we didn't like. Okay, I think we're going to come back to some more stuff that we liked later, but there's some other stuff that I want to talk about. Oh, what well, one thing that was not a nice touch was uh, the canisters of steam mm-hmm. um, have trophies on, which just seemed like a good representation of that. It's not mentioned in the book, but like Rose knows whose steam is in each canister. So having little trophies from the people, like, I think makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's a notion, and I think it's mentioned in the book. It's a little bit more obvious in the film, 
Crow suggests that the world isn't as steamy as it once was. Yeah, in the film specifically, yeah. Yeah, I think that the general idea that it's harder to come across people with steam is a thing in the book. It's not as obvious, though. Yeah, because they start relying more and more on tragedies. Like, they go to yeah. Juarez and stuff because it's the murder capital of the continent. Um, yeah. But uh, they don't seem to really be making a connection to the fact that they're killing... This is a hereditary trait, and you're killing kids with it so... Logically. There's not people being born this way. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of self-awareness. I think it's a real shame that the film doesn't have any of that storm-chasing element in it. Yeah. I think it helped a lot to sort of place them in the larger American society and place them a little more firmly in that background. I know that we're being mean to the film, and it's a... It's a two and a half hour adaptation of a 500 page book. I know that they can't fit everything in. I know that if they try and get more stuff to fit in, it's going to feel rushed. That's fine. And I have no problem with that as long as the decisions that are made are smart and the time is used well, etc. And I know I'm not a filmmaker and therefore I probably don't understand the limitations. And blah, 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 blah. However, I'm going to be the shitty person over here telling them how they should have done it. They removed the character of Casey, mm-hmm. the mentor in AA. Yeah. They keep those traits and split them amongst Billy, uh, Dan's first friend when he gets to the new area, and John, Abra's pediatrician who's also in AA because coincidences are a whole thing in this book. Really smart idea. Thought that was great. And then they have John in it for about 45 seconds, and then we never see him again. Yeah, and it's really weird because he's set up and established really well in a way that's a little rushed, but it's not too bad. It's, It's forgivable, but... We have the scene that, like, establishes him as a character, and then nothing. And so it just, it feels like there was supposed to be more of him in the film. And it, I we keep forgetting we were going to go and try and see if there were maybe deleted scenes or something. Like, I think that we were just hoping that there were. We were I don't think there were. were. But it really felt like we were going to see him again, or why bother, you know? There'd have to be a different film in there somewhere. Like, it wouldn't be a deleted scene, it would be a deleted film. The film that I wanted this to be. Yeah. They make Billy into a mental character, and I think it does work. Mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit squash to have those two people be the same person, but I think it does work. To functionally have all three of those people be the same person, really. Really save on casting. Billy, very well cast. And then they kill him. For no good reason. In a just pointless way in a really shitty way yeah it's and in a way that has no emotional payoff Mm -hmm. it's a shock death it's much like the way they kill dick halloran in the kubrick film yeah and it makes me wonder if it's maybe part of that larger same homage because they do a lot that's trying to like really echo the shining so maybe it's something like that but i didn't like it in the shining and i don't like it here i don't buy that it's an attempt at an homage i think it's they needed to get the character out the way for what their ending of the film is, which we'll get into in a moment. Yeah, that's fair. And also just doing it for the shock value of it. And both of those are shitty reasons. Yeah. Um, they could have got the character out of the way differently if they really wanted to go that way. And I think that we're we're going to do a discussion at some point about deaths for shock value and the problem that I have with it. So I'm not going to go on about it forever here. They also killed David, Abra's father. Also for no reason. Yeah, it's it's thrown away. Like, there's a scene that confirms that he is dead. And then emotional payoff of, is very slim. Like, it's, oh, he's dead. Abro doesn't seem too bothered about it. Um, Which is weird. Yeah. And to be honest, I think that the character deaths are sort of minimized by The Shining. And, like, by Dan's awareness of people going on after death and having some other existence. Like... There's sort of this between the lines idea that since people go on and seem fine afterward, because we see like Dick talk to Dan from beyond the grave, that it's not a big deal if people die. And that's just, I I don't like it. It's reductive. It takes away the experience of the people who are alive, who have lost that person in their lives and of the possibilities cut short by those people having been killed. It's certainly not the message in the book. Right, it's definitely not the message in the book, but do you see what I mean? Like the yeah. film really does kind of imply like 
it's okay if people die because there is a reasonably cool existence after death. Yeah. We, we told you so. So don't be sad that this little girl's father is dead and that this guy's best friend and AA mentor is dead. Yeah, but also like the existence after death seems a little tenuous and often comes across as being trapped and horrific. So, like, Well, at least with the, the Overlook ghosts. Yeah. But like Halloran visits Dan and does say like, this world is a dream of a dream to me now. Like he's gone on somewhere else and it doesn't seem to be a distressing somewhere else. Yeah. And I think that the movie kind of uses that to do the heavy lifting of trying to get the audience to not be mad at them for the character deaths Yeah. But or confused that Dan and Avro seem cool with it. Maybe. But Billy's death does come out of nowhere and it's such a sudden death that there's no like final moment with Dan Mm -hmm. And so much weight has been put on that character because it's not just Dan's best friend. It's also his AA sponsor. That's the word. So yeah, I just remain mad at that. It was dumb. Yeah. And also it's, I don't think it's a good treatment of that relationship between a person and their AA sponsor for years. I've seen other things that do incorporate the journey of like alcoholism and like overcoming it or, you know, recovering from it through Alcoholics Anonymous and the relationship with the sponsor is treated seriously and with some reverence and with some fallout when something disrupts it because it is a relationship on which a lot rests. There's a lot of trust in that. Like that's a person that you are relying on to help catch you when you're at your weak points and, you know, yell at you when you're being stupid. The fact that they kind of cavalierly throw away that friendship. I mean, I guess they don't need him to be there for Dan because as we're going to get to, Dan dies at the end. And so maybe that's why they felt like they could get away with it more because Dan's also going to die. So he won't need Billy anymore. But like if he was not going to die at the end, like that would be quite a blow and make it even harder for Dan to maintain his sobriety. He'd have to form a new sponsor relationship and that would take a lot of time and a lot of trust. Yeah. So we'll, we'll go back into the things that we liked for a moment. The way that they integrated the book and the movie, mm -hmm. uh, by which I mean like Dr. Sleep and the movie of The Shining coming together to be Dr. Sleep, the movie. You mentioned that we see... Dick visiting from the bill on the grave. It's mm -hmm. one of the big complexities in the in doing this story is that at the end of The Shining, the book, the Overlook is blown up and Dick Halloran is alive. Yep. At the end of the movie, the Overlook still stands and Dick Halloran is dead. Yep. So I did like the way that Dick Halloran appears as a ghost a few times to sort of talk to Danny in various ways. You still get that mentorship re relationship while keeping true to the fact that Kubrick killed off Halloran. Yeah. Because if you, like, you couldn't replace that character with someone else. I think it is a shame that you lose the indication of Halloran and Wendy's relationship. Yeah. Which I think is a interesting friendship in the book. Having Dan's mind be represented by his dad's office in the Overlook and the maze outside, I think is a nice reflection of the threat of becoming his father and the trauma of that maze area mm -hmm. and those areas being repurposed. Mm -hmm. I thought that was clever. Just being very formative for him. Yeah, as opposed to it just being their room in the Overlook, which is what's in Dan's head in the book, mm -hmm. which I think works going from the book, but not. But if you've got the movie to draw on, I think that was a good idea. Yeah, I and mean, I think it also works well to recall those scenes from The Shining in the minds of the viewers of the film, which is a, clearly a priority to the filmmakers. They make a lot of effort to continue to revisit very specific scenes and locations throughout yeah. Dr. Sleep from The Shining. So let's talk about that. Early on, we get a shot of Danny having a dream about being in the Overlook and he's cycling his little tricycle thing down the aisles and he goes over the carpet and then over the hardwood floor and it gets all those sounds going in your head that you remember from the original film. It's uncannily well done. Mm -hmm. They really recreated that very well and I thought they used it to great effect. 
mm-hmm. in that first half hour of the film. Mm-hmm. Which we already said we really liked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little rushed, but otherwise very good. Mm-hmm. And then there's the bit at the end. The last... Now, what, what did I say earlier? I don't mind if they need to cut things out of the book, as long as the tie that they do have, they use well. Mm-hmm. The last, I think, 30 to 45 minutes of this film are a... Guided tour of the locations in The Shining. Yes, that's much nicer than what I was going to say. If you were doing a direct sequel of the film The Shining with no other source material, this last half an hour to 45 minutes is what you'd make. That's the only logical reason for it being there in the way that it is. It's all fan service. Mm-hmm. Very they, well done fan service. It's, it's beautifully done. Like going through the old rooms, going down the hallways, seeing old areas, recreating the scene where like Jack's trying to break into the bathroom when he's there screaming. All done with new actors, all done in high def. Very well done. But I don't think it was a good use of time. And I think that's fair. I think you could have kept some of it in much briefer flashes. And I understand the tension building of like the slow prowling through the halls. And I think that's what they're going for with all those long shots is the same reason. And I had a problem with the long shots in The Shining because I understand you're trying to build tension. You're trying to establish this sense of place, etc. But it was too much. What it felt like to me was... They approached a filmmaker who loved the original film. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, you want to make a sequel of The Shining? And he said, yes. Got his mind of what that would look like. And then they made him read the book. Mm -hmm. And he got half an hour of films worth into it and got bored and tried to work out how he could fit his film into it. Because it's all the things that you would have. The conversation with Jack Torrance, who's in The Overlook... It's very well done. I really like that scene as a standalone thing that has nothing to do with Dr. Sleep. But when you take into consideration the books, Jack Torrance that you see in the film hasn't been redeemed, which is such a big thing at the end of the book of The Shining that isn't at the end of the movie of The Shining. Yeah. And I think that that brings it to the ending of the film that I just hate, is that... They're trying to provide a redemption that doesn't happen at the end of the Kubrick film by having Dan become Jack to then be redeemed by doing what he Jack was supposed to do at the end of the book. He like They go through a lot of work to have him fall down the same flight of stairs, mm-hmm. have the same limp, run around with an axe in the same way, and be done to very much look like a Jack Nicholson type figure as he chases Abra out of the hotel. And he has that moment that happens in the original book of The Shining where he breaks free of the hold of the spirits and goes, you've got to get out of here. I'm going to go blow up the boiler. And he goes and he has his moment of redemption to set fire to the Overlook and defeat the evil and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, essentially, instead of making Dr. Sleep, they made actually the end of The Shining? Like, the end of the book. There was a point two-thirds of the way through where I saw where this might be heading, and I think I paused the movie and said, I think Stephen King likes this film because I think that they're going to blow up the Overlook at the end, and that is all he ever wanted to see happen. And you weren't wrong. No. But the problem is is that it completely ruins the message of the book. Yeah, which was exactly the same problem that we had with the film The Shining. But this one does it so perversely, like it almost is the opposite. The whole book is about how Dan doesn't become his father, works hard to do that, and gives a message of anger and vengeance is not the answer. And then the movie goes and says, oh, Dan becomes his father, and Abra never learns that lesson. Yeah. I mean, it really does set the stage for her to then grow up plagued by all of these same demons who will be, who we see are chasing her out of the Overlook the same way that the book Dr. Sleep opens with Danny, after the Overlook burned down, being chased by the fleeing ghosts of the Overlook. 
Yeah. The book is about breaking these cycles of intergenerational trauma and the film is about those cycles just keep on going. Yeah. It, they, it literally ends with that cycle beginning anew with Abra. And they have Dan be a Dick Helleran figure for Abra. And he's there and has the conversation with her, but doesn't have the conversation that he has in the book of how violence and anger and resentment is bad. And yeah. how you shouldn't be a sadist. Right. Because one of the, and I, we've alluded to this conversation a few times, but we haven't, I don't think we've really said what it was. And it's basically like, after they defeat Rose in the book, Abra is having this conversation with Dan and he is trying to tell her like, she shouldn't feel bad about defeating Rose, about killing Rose, pushing her off of the overlook. Because she was trying to kill her and she would have tortured lots of other kids. And she's like, I know that, but it keeps haunting me. And like, I know I shouldn't regret doing it, but I do. And he's like, do you regret killing her or do you regret enjoying it? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. I don't, I don't know this verbatim, but, and that is what she needs to realize is that she doesn't regret defending herself. She regrets taking joy in hurting somebody else. And those are two different things. They just happen to be happening at the same time. And yeah. you don't get that in the film at all. And that's the big realization is that even if what you did was justifiable, your reasons and your feelings about doing it matter anyway. It's not just what you did. It's how you did it. And who you are, what that says about you also is important because you have to live with that afterward. Yeah, I think... And, and I, I, I think we need to wrap up on harping on the film in mm -hmm. just a moment. But I think one of the things that really upsets me is that one of the most powerful moments in the book for me is after they've defeated Rose, when it becomes clear that Jack helped with that. Mm -hmm. And Dan sees Jack waving to him from the roof of the world that's replaced the Overlook. And I know it's such a sweet moment it has that element of redemption to it. And it's the connection that Jack needs to have, uh, that Dan needs to have with his father that he hasn't been able to have because his father died when he was five. There's something there and they have both got to a new place. And the fact that you don't get any of that and in fact get the opposite of it in the film really kind of upset me. Yeah. Because... Not only does Jack not have that redemption, they don't get that connection, but Dan looks for it. He has the sit at the bar and he tries to talk to his dad and his dad says, I'm not your dad, I'm, I'm Lloyd, and yells at him in the same way as he did in The Shining and uses the same lines about, you got to take your medicine. And it's just, I know, it seems like a heartless decision to turn that around. Yeah. And I understand why they do that. It's the same thing of they're, they're stuck with what happens at the end of The Shining. Jack Torrance died without making that decision and turning around. He's stuck in that selfish state like all the other ghosts at the Overlook. And so I can understand why it makes sense. It's still a perversion of everything that Dr. Sleep is trying to do as a book. And but, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you also, or between the two of us, maybe we did like see an easy fix for it. Which is if you have that conversation with Lloyd slash Jack at the bar, go just a little bit differently. So that instead of yelling and smashing the glass, Jack has a little glimmer shine through. Then you can twist around at the end and have Jack sort of send Dan on his way. Mm -hmm. and say, no, you go, and I will stay and blow up the Overlook, and have Jack have his moment of redemption that he should have had in the original Shining film there. Yeah. And let his son escape. I think you could do that, but I can also see that maybe kind of breaking the rules as established in the universe, where once you've died, you can't make that kind of a change, and you're stuck. Because that seems to be what's going on with the Overlook ghosts, that they're stuck. I think that you could argue that having your own child turn up and connect with you could be enough of a way to help you move on from that position. And frankly, if you're going to ignore the entire message of the book, mm -hmm. then I, I would rather have the message of the book be a little bit 
retained Mm -hmm. and lose the honesty to the universe. No, I agree with you. I'm trying to think from the perspective of like solving the problems left by the film in terms of trying to continue the book. Do you know what I mean? Of trying to stay true to the film that exists and the two books that exist when they contradict so fundamentally in a lot of ways. I could see somebody deciding, oh, well, we can't have Jack be redeemed because he's dead already and we're stuck there. I disagree. I think that the creative choice is there, but... Are you trying to suggest perhaps that we can't have a good adaptation of a Stephen King book in this particular universe because Stanley Kubrick has died and now they can't change that passage? Yep. He's one of the overlooked ghosts now. Yep. That's the real problem. He made he made those choices, and those bad choices can never be made differently again. Doctor Sleep is haunted by Stanley Kubrick. Is this in bad taste? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Hmm. <sighs> Sorry, guys. Okay. I think that that is probably enough of us shitting on this. The thing is, like, it's not a bad movie. It's just a bad adaptation. Yeah. And it could have been so much better. And so really, I think, really, it's just disappointing. It, it is. It is. It isn't a movie I want to watch. Like, if this wasn't an adaptation of a book that I like, I wouldn't have watched the movie. And if I had watched the movie, I wouldn't have come out of its liking it. Because they do things like kill off a character with no good reason for shock value. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole host of other things that they do. But, yeah. like... They also change the fact that Abra is related to Dan which means that she's no longer part of that legacy and that intergenerational passage of traits and inclinations, which is such an important part of the book. And so that's, I'm surprised it's taken us this long to mention it. That is a thing I had a real problem with, with the film, that they changed that. I had thought it was very clever the way that they had done it because when I thought they would preserve that connection, because the actress who plays Abra is black and so is the actor who plays her dad and they have her mom played by a white woman. And so you can kind of see like there are lots of interracial marriages in this country. And so it's like, yeah, sure. You know, Dan might have a niece who is black if his half sister who he didn't know married black guy and so initially it might be one of those things where like yeah he might not assume she's his niece but it's totally plausible and it's a way of being like okay this character's race isn't actually inherent in her character we can still have it open to whoever we think is going to do the best job in the part and i do think the actress who plays abra does a really good job portraying the character in like the space that she's given but then they just don't even have that relationship preserved in any way. Like, they sort of nod to it. Like, if you've read the book, maybe you might suspect it. But I think it's such an important part of the book that she is the new generation of that family and of that legacy. Yeah. There's just so many ways in which the larger through lines and messages of the book are completely abandoned in the film. Yep. I'm so mad. It could have been so good. I know. Or at least it could have been decent. Mm-hmm. If they just kept on with the same way with the first half an hour with the rest of the film and yeah. just stuck to it. So I think that's most of the stuff that we want to talk about with the main movie in the book. But I think the big question is, what are the main challenges and issues that Stephen King had to overcome? And do we think he was successful with revisiting such an iconic book that was made into a very different iconic movie 30 or 40 years later. Well, I would think just immediately that one of the bigger challenges would be going back and being able to read through something you wrote that long ago when you've grown and done so much more as an artist without getting sucked into all the ways that, like, you wish you'd done it better or mistakes you made and, you know, having that, like, filter of, like, why do people even like this? You know what I mean? I think that was probably present, you know, to be able to kind of see what's there to be able to move forward from it without being blinded by that, like, hindsight vision. Yeah. It's interesting. He must have gone back and reread it. Yeah, that's what I mean. I know that one of the acknowledgements is someone that he acknowledges in a couple of his books who 
knows his books extremely well. Mm -hmm. Like has read, I guess has read them all many, many times or something and was effectively his fact checker for his own work. Yeah, I do remember that. But he must still have read it for the broader strokes. Yeah, and also just for the, you know, the rhythm of the story, like the way that it goes. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's a lot more than just like the plot synopsis or even like details to fact check. I think if you're revisiting something again, this iconic and that you did such a long time ago, like you'd need to immerse yourself and get that experience of what is it like to read this book so that I have some sense of where people are in this world moving forward from it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating because one of the questions that I would ask is why, why would you do it now? Mm -hmm. well, now, obviously, loosely, like a few years ago, which fortunately he does talk about a bit in the acknowledgements is that there was someone who, like, people would occasionally ask him, like, whatever happened to that kid from The Shining? Mm -hmm. And it was something that was sort of playing on his mind for a long time, and eventually he did come up to it. And I can see that being a good way to get into something like this, and it's certainly him working through very different stuff to what he was working through 30 years before. Mm -hmm. It still blows my mind that it's something that he felt confident doing. Mm-hmm. It's very strange because I think it's a very successful sequel to The Shining. Mm -hmm. I think it does a very good job of tidying up a few things, giving a very genuine look at where this character might have ended up after a genuine period of time. But it's been so long that his writing style has changed so much. Like, I don't know how many words each book is, but Doctor Sleep is a much shorter book. We have it in different formats, so I can't just check page numbers, but... Yeah, his writing style is definitely very different from this one to The Shining, but I haven't read any other Stephen King books, so I don't really have a good sense of how his writing has evolved over time or how it might be similar or different depending on like what genre he's writing in, because I know he doesn't just write horror. But to me, it feels much more like the place he was in as a person was very different in writing Dr. Sleep. And that really shows very clearly, like with The Shining, you get a portrait of a very unhealthy place and a very hopeless time with only just the slightest indication that maybe it won't always be that way or maybe you can make a different choice even when you've been making the same bad one for a really long time, even when you know it's not the right one. And so there is some hope there, but it's so faint and it's just at the end. In general, it's a portrait of the worst of us and the worst of like what you see in yourself in really bad times. Whereas Dr. Sleep is chronicling literally the process of getting out of that place and into a much healthier place. And not just being in a healthier place yourself, but being in a place where you can help other people avoid your mistakes or overcome their own mistakes and be healthier themselves. I and mean, you can be a, a pillar of a community. And so I think that perspective and that outlook is just, to me, one of the bigger differences. And I think it's a big part of why, as you said, like The Shining is more of a horror novel than Dr. Sleep. It's much scarier. It is dwelling so much more on what is and can be terrible about people and Dr. Sleep is very much delving into the opposite, that potential to move forward and become better. Yeah, actually, I think that's a, that's a really good way of looking at it. One last dig at the movie is one of the problems I had is that that community isn't there. Yeah. You don't get the nod to the fact that he's had a relationship in this town at any point or anything. It's He, he knows Billy. And yeah. And he goes to AA. And to be honest, I think that's one of the worst things about, like, we can see the cinematic utility of combining the characters of Casey and John and Bill in different ways, but doing that does sacrifice one of the most important parts of how, why there are three different characters in the book, which is that picture of Dan making not just one, but lots of solid relationships that he can rely on for different things. And also the fact that you don't have the nurses in Rivington House mm -hmm. represented who trust him yeah and respect uh, him and it's part of that message of the book is no one can do it alone mm -hmm. you all need someone there to help you and you've got to be able to be the person who can help people later and then the movie is literally 
Dan gets to a point where he does it himself mm-hmm. and it kills him. Yeah. Like it's, it's a really shitty version of that message. Yeah. Anyway, I have read some, several other King books, some of his very early work and some of his very late work and a couple of things in between. And there is definitely a progression from very dense, thick books that do tend to be more depressing in their ways to books that are much faster paced and much easier reads, maybe. Mm -hmm. Not that they aren't scary. He does definitely still do scary stuff, but there's a certain change to the formatting. Those chapters that are broken up into much smaller parts. Another thing I, we haven't talked about as far as this question of like, what must it have been like to revisit that after so long? I think another important aspect of it is that he, you can tell from the acknowledgements that he acknowledges that The Shining isn't just his anymore because it's been such a huge part of popular culture, partially through the popularization of the Kubrick film, that it's not just him that he needs to think about in terms of what he's doing with the sequel and you can tell that because he did draw on other people in his community and other people who as you said like know his books better than he does to weigh in on like what am I missing in different drafts like what needs to be addressed what are the big questions that are on people's minds about the world that I made and then let go And I think that's an important dimension. Not that any artist owes us anything. Like, he could have written any sequel he wants. But he clearly also cared about producing something that felt true to the world as perceived by the people who have been consuming it for the past 30 years. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'm glad that he does sort of acknowledge that. I think one of the most interesting acknowledgements that's in there is, I think it was one of his sons who said, we need to see Dan at his lowest point. Mm-hmm. because that's the scene with Deanie and her kid. Mm-hmm. And I hate that scene. Yeah. But it needs to be there. Yeah. And the reflection on that scene at the end is very important with how you perceive yourself and things. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I mean, I think that he had a hell of a challenge with going back to this book. And I think he did a really good job, aside from the couple of things that we said that we really wish weren't in there. Mm-hmm. Um, or were done differently. Yeah, I think it was done extremely well. And I think that it's very true to the original that they fucked up the film as well. (laughs) Yeah, and in pretty much the same exact freaking way. Yeah. Ways. They did include the alcoholism in this version. That was good. Yeah. In the the original Shining, like, it's not about that struggle. It's just about Jack being bad. (laughs) Anyway, so I think that's a good answer to the big question. I think the bigger question is, which book is better? I would say that Dr. Sleep is better, Hmm. except for that beginning part that I probably wouldn't have gotten through. And so by that metric, maybe it's not because I probably wouldn't have read it. Would you have read The Shining? But I I also probably wouldn't have read The Shining. So yeah, if we're going by, if they're on equal footing for that, and that I probably would not have had the patience to get into them, either one, I still would say Dr. Sleep. Even though I was very mad about that beginning part of like the Dick Halloran thing, like if you get past that stuff, which I'd have to also get past similar stuff with The Shining, Dr. Sleep is a book that at least for me, like when you're in it, like in the middle of reading it, you think about it when you're not reading it and wonder what is happening or like where they're going with where Stephen King I suppose is going with certain things that have been established or hinted at or whatever and I think that to me is one of the markers of something that is that is good a good book is one that you dwell on and try to unravel and try to project within the world even when you're not actively reading it that's fair that wasn't something you experienced with The Shining then I don't remember thinking the same thing like there were times when I would think about it but more in an intrusive disturbing way because it's a horror much more heavy on the horror and so it's much more focused on setting up these disturbing images and ideas that then just sort of cling in the corners of my brain and like bother me when I'm not thinking about other stuff which is a big part of why I don't read horror for the most part because stuff bothers me especially when I'm like trying to sleep 
and I just don't like it, so I don't do it. But it's not ever in a, like an interesting, oh, like there are some interesting ideas raised or I wonder what this plot point's developing. It seems like we might be headed in this direction or like, oh, you know, oh, it's neat how this happens, you know? So yeah. there's more for at least my mind to latch onto and be interested by in Dr. Sleep and the way that it unfolds. Whereas with The Shining is very one note. It's the same from beginning to end in terms of what's being conveyed. It's the same messages and it's all done with the same kind of horror, creepy grossness. That's fair. Just variations on a theme. Does that make sense? Yeah. Much less complex to me. I mean, I suppose Dr. Sleep is also following one theme mostly throughout in terms of like overcoming intergenerational patterns and trauma, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, it sort of has three concurrent plots, whereas mm -hmm. The Shining, one thing is happening. Yeah. And it's a much longer book because there's a great deal of detail for every part of it and a lot of tension building. Yeah. Whereas I think Dr. Sleep is a bit more in your face. You're getting a lot more perspectives in Dr. Sleep. You're getting well-developed perspectives from even the villains and Rose. And you kind of, you understand them. You don't agree with them, but you understand them yeah. in a way that feels real. And you understand like the naive choices Abra's making at different points and like with her development and the way that she's characterized, like everything fits together in a way that makes sense and feels genuine. It all fits together very well. Everything kind of plays off of each other in a harmonious way that's all leading to the same place even though it's getting there in different ways. Whereas The Shining, it's, again, it's much more monolithic to me in terms of where it's going and what it's doing. And I think that makes sense because he's had 30-some-odd years to hone his craft and become a better storyteller and become a better writer and juggle those kinds of threads more effectively. And so it works really well in Dr. Sleep. So I think a uh, follow-up question, a uh, biggest question, <laughs> if you will, which movie's better? Also, Dr. Sleep, I think. I'm torn on that one. But I don't know. I have problems with both of them. Yeah. I think you can go and watch The Shining without having read the book, and it would make perfect sense to you. Yeah. I think if you go and watch Dr. Sleep and you've not read the book, yeah. then I think there's a lot of stuff where you go, wait, what? what? Yeah. Why would that person do that? Why is that <laughs> happening? I don't understand. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Even it, if you've seen The Shining. It would be a lot more confusing. Which is frustrating because if you have read the book, then you go, what? Why? Why have you done that? Yeah, I don't know. We talked about this when we watched it. Like, I don't know who they're trying to please with Dr. Sleep because, as you said, if you read the book, they're pissing you off. And if you haven't, you're confused. So I, think that, I don't know. <laughs> I think they're trying to please everyone yeah. and just failing it because of that. Yeah. Maybe they should have made two movies. One as a sequel to The Shining that had nothing to do with the book and one that was a sequel to the book that had nothing to do with the movie. Yeah, I don't know. I just really don't like the film The Shining. And I think part of that is probably because I read the book and it completely misses the entire point of the book and that really makes me mad. But Dr. Sleep does that too. Dr. Sleep has better representation. I think it has better acting. I think it has better casting, better special effects. I, I don't think know half and half on the casting i think that yeah. to be honest if someone was like what do you want to watch i'd say dr sleep but i'd get up at like the 30 minute mark and not come back yeah i don't know that's a really hard question like i it doesn't help that you don't like horror movies and yeah. the shining is probably the better horror movie yeah i think that is part of it like it's which is the better movie you're probably right it probably is the shining because it can stand alone and dr sleep really can't but I don't like either of them. So it's like in like, you know, abstract, which is the better movie. Yeah, probably The Shining. But I think they're both bad. If you did really enjoy the movie with The Shining, you should go and watch the, at least the last 45 minutes of the movie of Doctor Sleep. Just because some of the recreations of that were really good. Yeah. If you, if you love The Shining, the fan service in that like second half is like, it's for you and they do it really really well the jack nicholson figure that they have isn't quite right but he's pretty close yeah and actually the one moment that like i do really like from the later parts of that movie is when dan is talking to dick halloran in yeah. a patient room 
and he's taking pleasure in someone else's pain on some level and just something about his performance is very Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance. Yeah, it's really it, well done. It really is. Like, Ewan McGregor does a great job with that. I feel so bad for Ewan McGregor because he does he's so well cast and so well acted in that and the script and the direction I think just let him down. Yeah. Also, like, the hair and makeup people, because they really do a great job with, like, the way his hair falls in that scene. Everything, like, it's uncanny, and it's disturbing in a way that's very appropriate. And very appropriate to the book. Yeah. It's very much showing you that glimpse of that legacy and, and some of those toxic behaviors and ways of that Dan is still thinking in some ways like his father. I really want to see another version of that movie where Ewan McGregor still gets to play that part, but <laughs> just gets to do it right. Anyway, I'm going to shut up about this now. Okay. Just before we wrap up, I do want to just make a mention and just make sure I forestall any hate mail. There are a few times in this episode where I know that we said the world of The Shining books I am very aware that The Shining and Doctor Sleep take place within the larger Stephen King universe and that that's all one big interconnected thing and therefore lots of things can happen in this universe. I know. Please don't tell me. I didn't know, but cool. Oh, all the Stephen King books are interconnected. That might mean something to me if I'd read any other Stephen King books. Precisely. There's the TV show on Hulu, Castle Rock, that is a lot of different Stephen King stories interconnected because Castle Rock is a location that crops up in them. Okay. I think Shawshank Redemption might have a note in there somewhere. Anyway. Was that written by Stephen King? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yep. It's a short story. Huh. Called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Weird. I'm sure I've told you this. You may have. I have forgotten. Charming. I want to read the short story. I've never managed to lay my hands on a copy of it. Anyway. Okay. Fun facts. Here's a pretty interesting one. It doesn't work for the characters, so it's kind of dumb and maybe illustrates all the problems that I have with this damn movie. But apparently John's office, where Dan gets offered the job, Mm -hmm. is identical to Stuart Ullman's office in The Shining movie, including the paint color and the little American flag on the right side of the desk. That's a weird detail to include, huh? Oh, we talked about shared universes. Apparently, Dick Halloran actually appears briefly in It. Huh, that might mean more to me if I had seen or read It. Okay, here's something. Apparently, it took a lot of negotiating to get the film made. The director had to convince Stephen King that despite the fact that King hates the Kubrick movie, audiences were more familiar with that version than the miniseries, and therefore the movie had to really be a sequel of the Kubrick film. The miniseries? Yeah, they did a miniseries as well. Huh. That's, like, not made by Kubrick. And I think King prefers... That may have come up when we did the original episode. I forget. Hmm. I mean, that person was probably right. The film is pretty iconic at this point. There's a lot of fun facts that I'm finding that indicate that the guy that made this movie was a really big fan of the Kubrick movie. Which is Um, what you said. Right. I'm just going to blast through a few of these quickly. You see Dan reading a a magazine in an empty room at one point. When you see what it is, it's the January 1978 issue of Playgirl magazine that his father was reading while waiting to speak with Stuart Ullman in the original movie. Also, who the hell looks at Playgirl while waiting for a job interview? Jack Torrance. So fucking unprofessional. The sound of Dan's car driving onto the bridge in the woods is actually the sound of Lil Danny's trike on the tile in the halls of the Overlook. Uh, It's something we didn't mention, but there are various shots that are very clearly similar. Yeah. Oh, uh, one of the people that was considered for the role was Dan Stevens for um, Danny. He plays David Holler in Legion. Oh, huh. I could see that working. You can go and look up all the fun facts. I'm not going to read all of them. Very clearly homages to the original movie in insane detail all the way through. Okay, I think that that is our episode on Doctor Sleep, wrapping up our first year of this podcast. It's a great deal. If you want some more, we actually have more content. We do a little bonus episode before each of our episodes called The Pre-Ramble. 
you can go and find that on our Patreon. Through there, you can also get access to listen to us record live for only a dollar, as well as getting Discord access and some other stuff. Access to our bloopers and outtakes so you can hear all the stupid things that I say. And you can even get a fully unedited version so you can hear everything before we release the main episode so you can get there first. We also have a YouTube channel. You can check out our videos. They're sort of shorter, more produced things where we talk about smaller topics within works or general ideas. Just find that on YouTube by searching Unramblings. Thanks for listening to Unramblings. We hope that you will join us next time. You listening at home can't see the look that Sean is giving me over her microphone. Uh, it's the why do you make more work for me look. I thought it was just the not amused by me look. Mm. I made the sound effect, to be fair. I did the hard work there. True. Uh, what happens next? We oh, right. Um, stuff. Oh, we talk about the stuff. Mm-hmm. We don't, actually. We do a summary of the work. That's talking about the stuff. We could go back to the full old system and we could do the, like, how we prepared for it. Or you could just yawn at me instead. <laughs> right it's into like, the microphone. It's like commentary on uh, too much fluff in the old format.